All right, folks, in this chapter, we're going to talk about serial killers that kill as part of a team. So two or more um, killers. So in their 2004 to 2014 study, Hickey has 56 team killers out of 270 killers total. And these team killers are about one fifth of all serial killers. 80% of them are men, 20% are women. And on average, it's teams of two. They generally have one other accomplice. In terms of the race and ethnicity breakdown of the offender, about 60% are Caucasian, about a third are Black, about 2% are Native American, and 7% Hispanic. These offenders were born between 1931 and 1995 and were 28 at the Generally speaking, their average age at first kill was 28, and their average age at apprehension is 31. On average, they spent about two and a half years killing, and their victims ranged anywhere from 167 victims to 207 victims, with an average of three, three and a half victims per offender, and they were killing between 1994 and 2013. Now, in terms of their method of killing... Um, just about 50% killed by shooting only, and about 10% by strangling only. But nearly a third engaged in some combination of multiple methods of killing. Strangling, beating, stabbing, and or shooting. Now in terms of their victims, most of them killed adults only. 86%. 96% did have specific types of victims that they targeted. Their average number of victims per offender, so not per team, per offender is four to five. Um, about 82% killed strangers only, 7% killed prostitutes, about 40% killed men only, and 10% female only, um, with nearly half killing male and female victims. And as you can see, despite uh, the stereotype of serial killers um, being people who roam from one state to another, only 14% killed in more than one state. So the majority of cases involve two offenders, um, and there are some that have more than that. The largest group in the study had five offenders. And here we can kind of see a breakdown of the relationships. Um, so in terms of relatives, first it was husband, wife, followed by father, son, brothers, mother, son, father, mother, daughter, son, and cousins. And in terms of non-relatives, male-dominated teams, um, heterosexual lovers, gay lovers, lesbian lovers, and then finally female-dominated teams. So in the non-relative category, males almost exclusively assume leadership, right? So we saw there very few, um, you know, female leadership was at the bottom. Uh, cases were pretty rare in which non-related females mastermind multiple homicides, but they do occur. Every group of offenders had one person who psychologically maintained control of other members of the team. Now, some of these leaders were folks like Charles Manson, who have this sort of like mystical control over their followers, and others use various forms of coercion, intimidation, and persuasion um, to manipulate their co-offenders. Now, there are combinations of male-female teams, um, and in some rare cases, we have seen uh, women dominate the, the male in the killing relationship. Uh, some of those who led groups of team offenders experienced a sense of power and gratification, not only by killing their victims, but also by getting other people to do their bidding. Now, the females in this chapter, who are part of the subgroup of male-female team, tend to be followers and not leaders. However, some of them quickly learned how to kill, became equal partners in the killing, and then participated directly in some of the most gruesome cases. Now, leaders of some groups tend to go through a process of self-abdication. Um, they start placing, uh, even though they're the leader, placing blame for the murders on the followers. Um, for some followers, killing first became acceptable and then became desirable. And others continued to kill solely as a result of their relationship with whoever held the reins of leadership. Now, with only a few exceptions, most of these offenders did not have a college education um, and only some received uh, some type of like vocational training. And here we can kind of see a breakdown of um, their careers before or during 
their murderous rampages. Um, remember what I said in the previous chapter, there's no such thing as unskilled labor. But we can see here, right? There's nothing really here in terms of um, occupations that help us predict who would become a serial killer. Now in this study, there's 114 teen killers and they're responsible for between 426 and 583 murders. So roughly 15% of all the murders in this study. Uh, they're responsible for four to five killings per offender. Um, and they tend to be local killers, right? So they tend to remain in proximity to their killing sites. They're not generally place specific offenders. Um, and because of this, if their bodies were discovered quickly, um, it became easier to catch them. And so here we can see the breakdown from 1850 to 2004. So um, our author's first study, right? We can see in terms of traveling, whether or not they're local or they're place specific, right? So we can see how many offenders, uh, how many cases, um, how many victims, etc. And so we can see here um, percentage of offenders, right? Nearly half of them are local. And for percentage of victims, nearly, uh, you know, about 45% were also local. Now, teen killers do not appear to be gender specific. They equally select males and females as targets, um, especially those who are adults. But about half of all teen cases and offenders killed both men and women. Uh, and strangers are the most common victim. In 73% of cases, at least one female was murdered. And when it comes to teens, Teen offenders targeted female teens, that should say teens, twice as often as male teens. Now, as we've seen in our prior chapters, individual lifestyle really plays a role in the odds that you will become a victim of um, a serial killer. So again, people who are engaging in high-risk behavior tend to be at higher risk. Um, since 1800, 59% of cases have one or more victims who were low in facilitation. And since 1965, that's dropped considerably. Sorry, 1975. Right, so here we can see um, team offenders and their breakdown in terms of who they're killing by gender and who they're killing by age, right? So um, overwhelmingly adults only, right? Um, and kind of even break down in terms of male, female. Um, we can see further breakdown here um, of gender and age. These charts are in your book, so you can kind of peruse them in a little more detail there. Um, and then here we have the breakdown by relationship, right? So strangers, we can see here 75% of cases, 79% of offenders, right? Overwhelmingly, really like far and away the most common um, victim. We can also see their preference for victims. Right, so again, strangers, we're seeing kind of the same things that we saw play out with the male solo killers, followed by acquaintances, followed by family. Now by 2014, the average number of victims per case had fallen from nine to 12 to four to five victims per case. Um, having more than one offender involved in serial killing didn't increase the number of victims per case. Um, solo offenders were a little more likely to kill more victims, but not by much. Now, in terms of methods, guns were most commonly used by, by team offenders, um, but guns only are is about 25% of cases. So only about 25% of cases um, is there just this one method of using a gun. Now, the purpose here, remember, right, we're not trying to, serial killers are not trying to kill someone quickly, right? They want to keep them alive so that they can subject them to torture and mutilation. And so more than half of offenders use two or more methods. And several expressed enjoyment in being able to perform acts of sadism. And here we can see that breakdown, right? Firearms are about 64% of cases. Um, and a combination of methods is 54% um, is of cases. Now, teen killers compared to solo killers are more likely to kill for cult-related reasons. And some do use ritualistic torture. But most belong to larger teams of killers and are not the planners or decision makers. Um, most team killers do have a sexual nature as the motive, with the sexual assaults being methods of gaining control over their victims. And just like solo offenders, they are unlikely to be insane. 
right? And here we can see that breakdown again. I'm sorry, I guess I put this slide in here twice. Okay, so about half of team offender profiles had sufficient data to examine their prior history, right? So this means what we know about prior history is only true for half of these offenders, right? So we're missing a lot of data. We can't really draw strong, strong conclusions here, okay? But in terms of degree of facilitation, right, um, about 59% of cases are low facilitation. Um, these offenders are likely to have prior records for theft and sex offenses, and again, also to have a history of psychiatric problems, but team offenders were a little bit less likely than solo offenders to have a record of sex crimes. Um, in terms of their home lives, there's very little difference between team killers and solo killers. And here we can kind of see that breakdown of, um, you know, deviant behavior, criminal behavior, psychiatric, um, and psychiatric institutionalization. Now, in terms of what happens to these offenders, about 7% were killed or died by suicide before a trial could be held. But 67% um, do get a prison sentence with another 24% um, going to um, being sentenced to death. Um, so in the rare cases where someone is you know, confined to a psychiatric institution or confined to prison, the odds of them ever being released are slim to none. 